What if you were able to take a quick peek into your future and saw that sometime tomorrow one of your friends was going to ask you about your faith? Who knows how it'll come up, but the question is asked the way it's often asked. Sometimes even in the form of an awkward question like this. You're like religious, right? What's that all about? What would you say? Would you give just a quick answer? Do you know how to put your faith in the words? Why do you think she was asking in the first place? If this situation makes you feel scared or nervous or ill-equipped, then you're probably pretty normal. Honestly, most people are pretty terrified when the subject of sharing their faith is brought up. Maybe that's because when we talk about sharing our faith, or to use a big church word, evangelism, very often negative images come to mind. Maybe we're thinking, does sharing our faith mean we have to be creepy? A lot of us think negatively when we think of that word evangelism. So when this happens... You're like religious, right? I mean, what's that all about? We don't know how to respond. Sometimes it's because we don't want to sound like one of those weird people. But sometimes it's just because we really don't know what to say. Why is that? Why is it that it's difficult for many of us to talk about something as important as our own faith? That's it, isn't it? For a lot of us, our own faith is a scary topic. It was for me. It happened right here at a church just like this one. There was this big event, 200 junior high kids spread all over the lawn. It, I remember it like it was yesterday. There was a speaker and he was sharing the gospel and gave an opportunity for kids to come forward and put their trust in Jesus and meet with a counselor. I was one of the counselors. Now it doesn't get easier than this. Kids come up to you and they say, um, what he said, I want Jesus. And all you have to do is explain how to do that. I mean, everything's practically done for you. All you really got to do is put it in the words. You can't mess it up. I messed it up. Two kids came up to me and they said literally just that. They said, what he said, I, I, I want Jesus. All I had to do was explain to them in words how you put your trust in Jesus. I had actually done trainings. I, I, I had uh, memorized all kinds of verses. I knew the words to say, but that's when it happened. When it came to actually sharing my faith, I realized I had very little to share about my faith. You see, I, I knew the words, I knew what to say, but I wasn't putting these words into action in my life. Being real, I need Jesus just as bad as those kids did right there. That's the secret right there. We need Jesus. If you don't hear anything else today, listen to this. We all need Jesus. Whether you've made that commitment at one time or not, we still need Jesus. And when we finally realize how much we need Jesus, then we actually have something to share. So when you realize that and start living your life, that faith authentically, let me put it this way. An authentic faith opens the door to real conversations about our faith. So sharing our faith begins with an authentic faith, a realization that we really need Jesus. In other words, if we're actually excited about the fact that Jesus saved us, that excitement's gonna open the door to conversations with others. We see a perfect example of this in the book of Acts in the Bible. Near the beginning of the book, we meet a guy named Saul. He's this religious snob, really, that's what he is. He spent most of his time memorizing rules of do this and do that. Then he spent the rest of his time telling other people, hey, follow these rules. <laughs> Not cool. When Saul met people who didn't follow the rules exactly, he'd correct them, he even persecuted them. But then Saul met Jesus. Saul was walking along a road and Jesus decided that Saul needed to see the truth. Jesus appeared to him in a great light, bam, and literally blinded Saul. We read about that in Acts 9.4, Jesus said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And ironically, Saul, in his blindness, saw clearly for the first time in his life. 
That encounter with Jesus changed Saul for good. Even his name was changed to Paul. Paul no longer went around pointing out other people's faults. Instead, he began sharing his excitement about Jesus and what Jesus did for us on the cross. Basically, like one beggar showing another beggar where the food source is, Paul was sharing to others, hey, look how Jesus changed me. Wow, I need a change. He could change you too. So from that moment on, Paul always looked for opportunities to tell others about what Jesus did on the cross. One of many examples would be what he told the people in Pisidian Antioch in Acts 13. Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin. Paul's message was clear. I was hopeless, but Jesus saved me with what he did on the cross, and now I have hope. Have you thought about that? I mean, people get pretty excited when someone saves their life. That's what happened to Paul. Jesus saved his life. Guess what? Jesus saved your life too. That's where sharing our faith starts, with our own faith. You see, sharing our faith is much more than some presentation that we plan. Sharing our faith is much more than just a bunch of words that we say. It starts from something happening and something changing inside of us. Does that mean that sharing our faith doesn't involve words? Think about that for a second, because some people might uh, go as far as to say, I share my faith with my actions. I just live out authentically and people see how good I am and praise God. <laughs> Others might do the opposite and they'll say, no, I share faith with words only. So which is that? Is either of those right? Is sharing your faith just words or just actions? Let me read you two verses in 1 Peter chapter 3 that might offer some insight. Listen carefully. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. So what's this verse telling us to do? Is it tell us to use words or actions? Okay, let's see which elements of these verses have to do with words or conversation. Let's see, um, be prepared to answer. Someone asks you, give the reason. Okay, now let's look and see which of these have to do with action. Um, revere Christ as Lord, have hope, good behavior. See, it's funny, but I hear people quote this verse all the time, and it seems that most often they're quoting the part about always be prepared to give an answer. They'll spend all kinds of time preparing the words to say, and that's fine, we, we need to be prepared. I mean, that's what we're doing right now. But there's so much more to these verses than just being prepared to answer. So words, actions, could it be that maybe we're supposed to do both? See, there's a key element to this verse that answers that question. Don't miss it. This verse says, be prepared to answer someone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that's in you. Did you catch that part about the hope? Think about this for a second. The author of the verse is assuming that we as Christians are already doing something. He's assuming that we're already living out the hope. As a matter of fact, this verse is assuming that we're living out the hope so much that someone's actually gonna notice it and they might even ask us, hey, I noticed something different about you. You have hope. This book of the Bible was written to a bunch of Christians that were enduring incredible persecution. Many of them feared for their lives. Peter encouraged them to hold on to the hope of Christ during this time. I mean, this is noticeable when people are living for hope during bad times. I mean, others are gonna notice this and wonder, why is it that you're living out you know, as if there's something to live for? What is this hope? Let me ask you a pointed question. Has anybody ever asked you to give them the reason for your hope? I mean, honestly, think about it. Has anybody ever said, hey, I noticed that there's something different about you. You seem to have a hope, something greater. What's the reason? Why would someone ask you that? Or even would anybody ask you that question? See, here's what I'm getting at. One of the unseen elements of this verse is someone noticing the hope in us. 
this first Peter passage was written to these people that were undergoing this persecution and the way we respond in difficult times is one of the clearest ways people see our faith. When someone sees hope in us, they might ask us the reason we have it. I have a friend named Kira. Kira's an amazing girl. She went to Kenya there where she served for a year and she uh, worked with a village. She helped AIDS victims. She's an amazing girl and she just loves Jesus so much. When she came back to the United States, her laptop broke. And Kira, just in her own way, went to the laptop store. When she walked into the laptop store, she goes, oh man, I'm so bummed about this laptop. She goes, I know that God wants me to use this laptop when I go back to Africa and I know he's going to fix it. Will you help me? And the guy behind the counter, who happened to be a Muslim, asked Kira, are you religious or something? And Kira goes, oh, I love Jesus so much. And she starts talking to the guy. She starts talking about Kenya. And she starts talking about how God had mercy on these people and, and how exciting it was to work for God. Kira's just that way. And before you know it, Kira's having this conversation about Jesus with a Muslim. This happens to Kira all the time. You know why? Because her faith is so real. It just reeks from her pores. Sharing our faith begins with us living out our own faith. That doesn't mean being perfect. No, none of us are perfect. It just means living authentic lives, lives that need Jesus badly. And guess what? As our friends recognize our very evident and real need for Jesus, they might be willing to talk about it. They might even ask us the reason for the hope that they see in us. And if we're prepared, and when this happens... You're religious, right? What's that all about? We should be prepared how to respond. Our response is a big part of these sessions. After all, if we live out an authentic faith, God's going to open doors to real conversations where we can tell others how much we all truly need Jesus.